Hello, everyone, and welcome to ACS Webinars, connecting you with the best and brightest minds in chemistry, live from Washington, D.C. I'm Michael David, and I am pleased to be your host for today's broadcast, which is being co-produced with ACS Graduate and Postdoctoral Scholars Office and the Petroleum Research Fund. Today, we will be joined once again by Nancy Jensen, who is a program manager and assistant director of the Office of Research Grants here at ACS. Nancy is here to provide some practical tips on identifying funding sources, suggesting effective approaches for presenting research plans, and identifying some common pitfalls in preparing proposals. We would love to get you involved in the discussion, and you can share your thoughts and questions in the questions panel. You can also join the discussion on Twitter by including at AmeriChem Society in your tweet. The slides for today's webinar can be accessed right now by clicking the link that you see in the GoToWebinar control panel. An invitation email to view the recording from today's presentation will be sent to all registrants in a few hours, and that recording will stay open for a 24-hour period, after which it will be removed, edited, and become an ACS member benefit. Our moderator for today is George Schlatterer, who leads the ACS Graduate and Postdoctoral Scholars Office here at ACS. Prior to coming to ACS, Jörg worked as the, at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City, where he co-created and directed the Career and Professional Development Program for graduate students and postdoctoral researchers. He has also worked as the Assistant Dean of Faculty Professional Development at Columbia University Medical Center and the National Science Foundation. And with that, Jörg, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you so much, Mike, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to moderate today's session on how to win funding, compelling grant and fellowship applications. I'm a chemist who received his PhD from the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Before I joined ACS to lead the Student and Postdoctoral Scholars Office, I worked for many years in academic research, looking actively for funding in Europe and the US. I felt honored that I was selected to serve as a program director at the National Science Foundation between 2014 and 17. It was exactly there where I started to realize that successful grant and fellowship proposals share common elements. And in fact, regardless if you work in academic for profit or nonprofit or in the nonprofit world in the US or abroad, as scientists, you will continue to seek funding to translate your ideas into reality. Information sessions like this one, led by experts, pave the way for your future success. Today's expert is Nancy Jensen. Nancy is a program manager and assistant director of the Office of Research Grants at the American Chemical Society, and she brings a wealth of experience to our society, ranging from academic to industrial research, patent law to secondary school teaching. And with that, Nancy, thank you so much for being with us today, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, York, for that nice introduction, and thank you to those of you who are participating this. We hope that in this webinar this afternoon, we hope that this is helpful to you, and we thank you for joining us. Uh, towards the end, we will have my contact information there. Should you have follow-up questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. Okay, the biggest pragmatic question in all of science is, how will I fund the research? There's all sorts of ideas in science, but they don't get very far unless there's funding to do the research to support the, to, to do the research to follow up on these ideas and do the experimentation. And all research costs money, some much more than others. There's the expense of equipment, there's expensive materials, uh, personnel, salaries, and so forth. And so it's critical to have funding to being able to do research. We have our first poll question. Uh, Michael, do you want to take over here? All right, so this is going to be our first of five poll questions today. And we're going to start out with a pretty easy one, and that is for a successful proposal, all you need is a great idea. Would you say that statement is true or false? Now, to answer this, all you need to do is click on one of those radio buttons you see in front of you. And I'm seeing a few of the votes come in now. And just a reminder, we are eager to get your questions for the Q&A portion of today's webinar. And there's no need for you to wait until the end of Nancy's presentation to start asking. So feel free to ask a question whenever it comes to your mind. And with that, I am going to close this poll in five, four, three, 
to one. And Nancy, we had 17% say true and 83% say false. Well, that always makes me feel good because I know that at least some people are going to be finding out some things for the first time. Uh, the answer is, uh, uh, most of you got it correct, is this answer is false. Uh, a successful, a, a great idea is certainly important, but that's only half of the issue. If you have a great idea and you don't have an effective presentation, it's not going to get funded. That presentation, the effective presentation of the idea is just as important as having a good idea. Now, good ideas, how to teach that and so forth, I, I have some ideas on that, but that's not the topic of our, our talk today. We're going to talk about the effective presentation of the idea because everyone can learn to do that. That's a learned skill. And so this is something that you can do. It's something that's just as important as the ideas. Our outline of topics for today, we're going to have some basic guidelines and resources. We'll give some information on funding sources and agency information, some specific writing pointers, which that's we're going to have some poll questions around those, some common pitfalls. We're going to talk about facing rejection. That's not a very happy subject, but there's a lot more proposals than there is funding for them. And so that's an inevitable thing. And then some final thoughts. Okay, looking at our basic guidelines and resources. Okay, the first of these, we're going to do kind of this as a countdown. This is six. We're going to count down from six to one here. So number six is demonstrating managerial skills. If you're asking people for money, they want to know that that money is going to be spent wisely and effectively. And so you need to show that you can you can manage. You can manage spending the money wisely. You can manage people, uh, that you have the resources and the facility to do uh, what you're, you're planning to do. You need to set forth a very clear and a very pragmatic or practical research plan. Uh, it needs to be something that's consistent with the amount of money you have, the amount of time that the grant uh, is it would would extend for uh, etc. You need to have a very clear, very very practical plan, and it needs to be well organized. If your if your proposal is not well organized, the reader has the sense that you may not be very well organized in carrying out the research, and that's not a positive when you're asking someone to give you money to do the research. They want to know the money is they're going to get value for their their dollar or their pound or their euro or whatever. I know we have a lot of international people here, so whatever the um, whatever your currency is, people want, funding agencies want value for the money. Okay, number five in the countdown, know the agency's mission. Every funding agent has it, agency has its own rules and its ideas and its regulations about what it can fund. For example, my organization, PRF, what we can fund is regulated, it was the fund was set up by a court, uh, the action of a court, and as the result, we can only fund certain things that the court put down in our original charter, our original documents. So there's rule, there's ideas, there's rules, there's all sorts of things around this. Now, typically a proposal for one agency is not suitable to send to another agency. It certainly is not suitable just to change the cover letter and, and send it to the next agency. That's That's not good. Your proposal has to be um, has to be framed, has to be presented in a way that's consistent with the agency's mission and goals, and with the agency's guidelines. You have to f follow the guidelines for the agency, and every agency has their own guidelines. Uh, they're all a little bit different, so you you need to be attentive to that. Now, uh, what about if you uh, you want to you have an idea and you and you really would like to apply to several agencies, a, a general research program. One thing you can do is to think about that in sections. And I make a simple example here. Suppose you need both instrumentation, you have a project you want to do, you're going to need instrumentation. You may be in one grant able to apply, in one agency apply for instrumentation because some agencies that's what they fund. Another agency apply for materials and salary information, uh, salary support. Um, again, think about various pieces of it, um, of your overall research plan, and you may be able to parse that out and find sections that would focus to different agencies. And a, a real common mistake, and particularly of people that are starting, you have a brilliant idea that you think the agency can't 
possibly refuse to give you money. So you write this argument to the agency about why they should fund you. Uh, again, back to point one, funding agencies have their rules and guidelines. And even though you may have a great idea, arguing to get your, the agency to fund you if it's not in their mission already and not in their goals already, it's not gonna be funded. That's that's just it. It could be the great the greatest idea in the world, but if it doesn't fit the agency. So uh, again, keeping that in mind, find an agency that it does fit. Okay, number four, read all instructions carefully. Be sure that you follow the instructions very, very carefully. A common reviewer comment is, if the PI can't follow the instructions for the proposal, then the PI probably can't follow the instructions to do elaborate research. So very, very important. Now, not only do does every agency have its own specific rules and guidelines, but those are not set in, in CMAP. Those can change uh, from time to time. And so be sure that you have a current version of the agency guidelines. For example, if you applied last year, you weren't funded and you're going to reapply, look at what the guidelines are this year. Uh, I give you a, a simple example, and that is for our Petroleum Research Fund, we have four kinds of grants. Uh, two of those kinds of grants are in the US only, and those are the uh, new investigator grants. And the reason for that is that uh, different countries have such different systems in how new professors are brought into the uh, to the system. Um, it's it, That's the reason for making that decision. At any rate, so we have this new investigator grant. For years and years and years, we have two kinds of them. One is for new investigators that are in doctoral institutions, the, the doctor, doctoral granting institutions. The other is for uh, researchers that are in what we call PUIs, or ones that have undergraduate or at most master's programs. And this grant for, since the beginning of the grant, these grants was, it was, people were eligible for their first three years of their first academic appointment for both sets. And this last year, uh, the advisory committee that we have for the PRF and then ultimately the ACS Board of Directors elected to change that eligibility guideline for the undergraduate researchers. The idea being that uh, in, in doctoral programs, getting a research program started, and that's a, a major emphasis, whereas in the undergraduate programs, there is, um, more of an emphasis on teaching, higher teaching loads, and often less infrastructure for starting a program. So now, different than it's ever been before, for new investigators in, in doctoral institutes, it's still three years, but for new investigators in non-doctoral institutions, it's um, five years from the first appointment. So again, rules can change, even in the same agency. Be sure you have up-to-date rules and you're following the up-to-date guidelines. Okay, number three, write with confidence, but don't disregard uh, other ideas. Your proposal should convey the attitude that you are, you've identified an important problem, you're the person to work on it, and you're going to get some results out of this. You have a plan that's going to get you to some results. Also important is you need to show that you're aware of previous relevant studies. That does not necessarily mean just studies that support your, your hypothesis. If there is literature out there that is negative to what you're proposing to do, you need to address that. This is not, you're not selling something in the sense of persuading, you're trying to present a clear picture and why your research should be funded and why it should work. So how do we handle that? Okay, if, there are, if there's literature out there that suggests what you're, that what you're proposing is, is, not, uh, is not viable, Okay, one of the things you want to do is distinguish what you're doing from the previous literature. Maybe you can say, you know, the article X uh, was done in an acid solution, we will be using a neutral solution. Maybe it's as simple as that. Uh, another way to, uh, another thing to do is uh, you also want to um, show um, alternatives um, in terms of why you think it's going to work. Uh, that, that it's done a different way or distinguishing what you're doing um, is another is is important to, to, to doing this with the relevant <clears throat> breath here. Um, it's important to make sure that you cover everything that's relevant, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. 
Okay, number two is have a great scientific idea. As we said, that's that's half of it. Writing is the other half. You need one that's novel, that has relevance to identified target, that can be investigated thoroughly within the context of the time and the institutional resources available to the PI. Now, this is my only real comment on novelty in, in terms of coming up with an idea, but I think it's an important one. Novelty often derives from detailed study or observation and understanding of a problem or a challenge. We all do, we all go to meetings, we read the literature, we detailed study is fairly obvious. But the observation one is the trickier one. And that is scientists, even though we're supposed to be people that observe and question and have hypothesis, tend to have the have the tendency to when something doesn't go like it's expected to say what did i do wrong and try it again well molecules don't read and write molecules didn't read your proposal they don't read the textbooks they do what they want to do when they want to do it and so those observations of things that didn't go like you expected them to go are often the key to really exciting research it happened in my own doctoral program. Uh, I was a very exciting project in which I found that molecules in high, high energy collisional activation, co-shelled ions, high energy collisional activation in mass spectrometry, preferentially fragmented as far away from the charge or radical site as possible. Prior to that, it had been dogma. It had been the first sentence in any book about mass spectrometry, that mass spectrometry was the result of fragmentation induced by the charge of radical site. Very exciting project, but absolutely what you didn't expect to have happen at all. And yes, it was tricky to prove it, and there was a lot of synthesis and other things involved in doing it, but yes, it, it has held the test of time, and yes, that is what happens. Uh, other examples, uh, Perkin and the first uh, commercial dye, the, the mauve dye. Uh, again, he was a student. He was not even a professor. He was a student uh, and, and an experiment didn't turn out right. And in cleaning up the test tube of yuck in the bottom of the test tube, it, he found this beautiful purple color and, and was curious about it. And that led to the first dye. So things that don't work out like you expect can be real, give real insight into some very exciting science, don't ignore that. Okay, and finally, if in doubt, contact your program officer, preferably before you spend time writing an, uh, a non-compliant uh, proposal. Now, program officers, yes, one of our jobs is to look at the proposals that come in and process them and get reviewers and get them to a decision committees and all those sorts of things. Sure, that's, that's a, a chunk of our job. But we're there as a resource for, for potent PIs and potential PIs. And it doesn't matter whether it's PR, PRF or NSF or any other agency that's a granting agency, they're going to have program officers that are there to help. Now, how can they help you? Well, they're not going to write the proposal for you. But in terms of understanding the rules, remember we said these agencies are very specific in their rules and it's very important to follow the rules exactly. And so rather than guess at what a rule is meant or what the requirement is, contact the program officer. Uh, again, a major resource, something to be, be used. We also take calls when people are unsuccessful, not to hear them complain about not getting the, the grant, but rather trying to assist them in evaluating, is this worthwhile to reapply? Uh, what, what were the issues, et cetera, that were problematic? Now, when you talk to a program officer, I shouldn't have to say this, but I do anyway because there's people that seem to not know this from time to time. You need to be polite, respectful, and honest. Do not, do not tell a program officer uh, a, mo deliberately mislead them. That will be uh, something that will uh, be problematic to you in the long run. Uh, for a long, long time. And yes, we do find out in various different ways when people have not been honest, and this may prevent you from being able to apply to the agency further, for example. So very, very important. And again, we're facilitators, we're a source of information, we are not the ultimate deciding people. So again, uh, venting is not something that's, that's useful. Venting or arguing is not useful. Okay, now when you contact the program officer, uh, 
again, uh, be ready with your questions if you have questions. If you're looking at wanting to understand the guidelines or the rules better, have your questions ready, but also be prepared to uh, converse with the, the uh, program officer regarding your research objective and why you're applying to that agency, why you pick this agency, how you think it fits. I will tell you in PRF, uh, very often a potential PI's idea of how it fits and how it really fits are not exactly the same thing, but it's a very useful conversation and it will help um, potential PI's refocus their research to uh, be uh, applicable to PRF. Now, I have a list of questions here, and if you look at these questions, you're going to say, but these are kind of things I'd like to know. So why am I saying don't, why am I saying don't ask these questions? Well, it's what we call framing your question. It's how you ask. So if you look at this, you'll say, will you fund my research? What are my odds of being funded? You've put it in the personal sense. The program officer isn't going to make the decision. They can't really tell you anything about your specific proposal. But what they can say is, this is a topic that is within the scope of what we fund. This, is, this would fit in the, in the scope of funding of the agency. Um, we can say that the funding rate is typically about 20% for PRF, 20% of the proposals that are uh, come in are funded. So we can tell you information like that. We just can't tell you things to your personal situation. We can give you the general statistics. Similarly with the research, the good research topic, that, that comes under the same sort of thing in terms of we can tell you whether it fits with the kind of research that we fund or not, but whether it would be, whether it's a good topic uh, that's that's another question that, that's getting to the scientific merit and we don't evaluate that. Uh, and then finally, the question about who are the reviewers. Typically, reviewers are kept confidential simply because, first of all, reviewers are very busy people and they've been helpful in giving these reviews, uh, but we don't want PIs calling them, uh, disappointed PIs calling them and, and uh, being problematic. So it's in, in some ways a, a way to protect reviewers. And when you become a reviewer, you will appreciate the fact that uh, you don't have PIs calling to argue with you about your review comments. Okay, funding sources and agency information. Okay, there are many sources. Government agencies are often big dollar agencies uh, and a variety of programs, so that's very important but there are other sources. PRF, for example, a private foundation formed as a result of a court uh, settlement. Uh, there's internal sources, and of course, there's industry. Now, industry, if you're uh, an established researcher, this uh, has a lot more potential than if you're just beginning. Typically, industry will not fund unless it's the person has established some expertise that's of interest to that industry, but once you get yourself established, uh, that can sometimes, if you have an interesting uh, uh, an area of research that's interesting to industry or a, an industry, it can be very, very lucrative. Uh, you can get very good funding from that. But again, you, you're going to have to establish your expertise before that becomes a big player. We've hinted at this before, but again, your research objective needs to match the agency mission exactly. I mentioned PRF it's got, because of its, its origins, it's got some kind of interesting requirements. And very often, if the potential applicant were actually to send in their application in what was their mindset, it probably wouldn't be very successful. But very often, I'd say about 85% of the cases, in talking with the potential applicant about what they want to do, we can assist them in framing it or or framing a, emphasizing a, a, an element of their research that matches with the agency mission. So uh, again, this is a good spot for talking with your, um, your program officer to uh, talk about how it fits and very often fits the agency. And very often the program officer can help you focus it uh, to, to fit even, to fit very well. Okay, information on US federal grants. I know we have a lot of international people here. Uh, there's, uh, we have www.grants.gov, and that's a site for all of the different agencies, all of the U.S. agencies, various agencies, and you see them over there on the side, they're various little uh, insignias. All of them have their own sites as well, so that's U.S. 
another source of finding information is there's a web-based subscription service called Pivot that uh, sometimes library, university libraries or grants offices have a subscription to. This has a considerable database of available grants. If your institution has that, this is certainly a, uh, a, a source worth checking out. I personally have not used Pivot because we, I don't have access to it, but I know from uh, talking with people that have, this can be very helpful. The other item on the other side of the page is just general internet searches. Um, I'm sure that all of you on here are on this call are much more adept on a computer than I am. I am such a dinosaur that I got my first chemistry degree doing my calculations on a slide rule. Uh, handheld calculators did not exist at that point. So uh, I'm sure you're all much more adept, but I, can, uh, I have no problem finding uh, not just for the US, but any country. Last week I did a, a webinar for ACS in India and within a couple of minutes in a Google search, I came up with some information on funding agencies in India. So again, simple general internet searches can help a lot as well. Uh, I know that there are several of you on here that are students and postdocs. Uh, Jorg has kindly provided this link on grad funding that uh, for ACS, uh, that ACS has on the ACS website, it has other things besides ACS, of course, on there. Um, but on the ACS website, it's got grad funding, and these are uh, sources of funding for students and postdocs. And certainly, you can um, find some information there. Now, that's the agencies per se. Uh, another resource that's good to look at is. Uh, what kinds of things an agency's been funding? What kind of research are they interested in? And so various agencies have their reporting. We in Petroleum Research Fund have our annual report. And that will have uh, people who have received grants have to turn in a year, yearly narrative report about what they've done. So you can get a feeling for the kinds of things that, that are being supported. Uh, there's a similar uh, uh, database for uh, Research Corporation for Scientific Advancement. And then for the federal sources for NSF, you see there's several links there where you can get information about what NSF is funding. And this is then for the National Institutes of Health. I'm moving through here rather fast, but as I understand, you do have access to the slides if you want to go back and, uh, and explore these uh, links further. So these are all sources of, of information about what an agency is funding. Now, one caution on this, uh, it gives you the general idea. But if you go in there and you see, oh, oh, somebody's gotten a funding on an inorganic chemistry project where they've used ruthenium as a as the metal in a in a complex catalyst, and you say, oh, they've used ruthenium, I'm going to use rhodium. There better be a good reason why you do it. It shouldn't be just because it's new, it hasn't been done, does not mean it's good science. And so a little bit of a question about uh, being careful not to do me too science, saying, oh, they did this, you could go ahead and do X, Y, or Z. Make sure that, that what you would be going ahead to do is something that's um, that has a significant novelty and meaningfulness, and it's not just something different that hasn't been done before. Okay, now for the specific writing pointers. Okay, so you have the idea, how do we actually go about getting this onto to paper, or, or I shouldn't say into the computer now. Uh, paper writing is, is again, I'm back with the dinosaurs. Okay, we need a clear presentation. That goes back to that very first slide about managerial skills. You need a clear presentation. You're gonna to need to state the problem of the hypothesis. You know, what is it we're going to, to study? What is it we're going to try to, to investigate? Why is the issue significant? Now, this does not necessarily mean that it's something that's going to save humankind. It means that the issue has to be significant to at least some, uh, some discipline of, of uh, science. Uh, it, it may be very theoretical, uh, but it needs to be of interest at least to some, some uh, group of, of individuals. And then what you're going to do, you need to, you're not going to write a recipe like a cookbook, but you do need to be able to clearly articulate what it is you plan to, to do. Now, that's the, that's the key things you need to state. You need to explain how you will carry out the proposed work. Uh, this is gonna be, you know, people, that, the, the resources that you have, uh, how you're going to progress through your studies, et cetera. 
you need to address, and this is very, very important, you need to address relevant potential challenges and alternatives. There is no science project that's without, that, that lacks challenges. It wouldn't be a science project it wouldn't be worth doing if you were sure of what the outcome was going to be. So every project has points that are less certain than others. You need to address those relevant potential challenges and also why you think you can overcome those challenges and or what the alternative is. Now I've spent some time, some extra time on this particular little section here because this is often when you have a stack of 10 good proposals and you have the money for eight grants. This is where this becomes a key factor in deciding who gets the money. Maybe good ideas, but the one who has the better under, conveys the better understanding of what their challenges are and how they will work around them in the competitive phase of getting the money, this is a very critical factor. Okay, and then finally, we touched on this earlier, you need to address the relevant literature. And that's all relevant literature. Okay, state your research objective. Uh, make clear in the first paragraph exactly what this research is about. That is the most important paragraph that you write, and it should very clearly set forth what you're going to do, why you're going to do it, and what, what you expect to get from it. And then you should have a statement of your research. Your statement of your research objectives uh, should lead directly to your methodology. In other words, you have a an objective. How are you going to test that objective? How are you going to follow up and get that? Uh, you need you need to have it clear that there's a a real plan for how you get from the research objective to the methodology. Okay. And Mike, I think we have another poll here. All right, so we're going to be asking a series of polls, and the text is going to be a little bit long to fit in the polling software, so it will also be posted in the chat window, so you can see it below, but I'm also going to read through it. Our first poll is, <clears throat> which of the following do you think best conveys the is the best way to convey the overarching general nature of your research? Is it A, the proposed research is directed to the synthesis of analogs of dimethyl chicken wire, a natural product known to have antimicrobial properties. B, the proposed research includes building a library of compounds and testing them for antibiotic activity and cancer prevention properties. Or C, the proposed research is directed to the synthesis of fluorinated analogs of dimethyl chicken wire, a natural product known to have antimicrobial properties. The analogs are projected to have a better bioavailability and accordingly higher potency than the natural product. And I can see the results coming in now. I want to give you a little bit more time to enter in what you think uh, the best way to convey the overarching general nature of the research is. And with that, I am closing this in five, four, three, two, one. And on this one, 57% uh, said C, 33% said B, and 11% said A. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Nancy. Okay, thank you. So we do have some things to talk about here. Uh, first of all, for those who selected B, um, that's pretty problematic because you really have, have made a very wide statement. We're going to build a library. We're going to test them for antibiotic, antibiotic activity and cancer prevention properties. One thing that I often hear from disappointed applicants is the research, the uh, reviewers didn't understand what I was talking about and they, they didn't get it. And then I go back and I read the first two pages of their proposal and they've said, you know, so many cubic uh, meters of methane is produced a year. It's been that way since 19 da 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 and on and on. And they're wandering all over the place. They don't give the specifics. They've done a hand wave. They've done a generalization. So remember I said the first paragraph's most important. A is not too bad. The proposed research is directed to synthesis of analogs of dimethyl chicken wire, a natural product known to have antimicrobial properties. That's much more specific. That's better. Not too bad. But my favorite one is C. And this is, goes back to what I said about that per first paragraph being important. We're telling what we're going to do. We're going to direct it towards the, uh, the synthesis of fluorinated analogs. We've said 
what we're making, fluorinated analogs, synthesizing them. We're doing it because it's a natural product known to have antimicrobial properties. And if we do it and succeed, it's going to have better bioavailability and accordingly higher potency than the natural product. So we in those two in that in those two sentences we've given a very solid overview of what we're doing, why we're doing it, what we expect to, to have happen, and that's that's the kind of thing we're looking for in that first paragraph um, to get people focused on on where where you're going. Okay, and for the next poll, Mike. All right, the next poll, and again this has just appeared in the questions window, the full text, um, and I will launch it now. Which of the following do you think is the best way to convey the newness of your idea to reviewers? Or to be A, the proposed research has never been done before and will revolutionize organic synthesis. B, the proposed research provides a new method for functionalization of heterocyclic compounds in a one-pot synthesis using an iron catalyst. Or C, the proposed research provides a novel approach for, to functionalization of heterocyclic rings. And I am seeing the votes come in now. And we'll be closing this poll in just a little bit in five, four, three, two, one. All right, uh, just 2% said A. Uh, the majority at 76% said B. And 22% said C. OK, you guys are good. Um, B is the, is the preferred answer. Uh, a uh, is problematic because, first of all, your proposal is going to go to experts in the field. The reviewers are going to be experts, knowledgeable. The decision panels are knowledgeable people. And this is a little like we would say, and I know we've got a lot of international people, so I hope this isn't, uh, isn't too uh, misleading in terms of uh, an analogy, but the A is what we would call the used car salesman. You're not selling something. You're you're providing the information about you know why this is important. The people that you're you're giving this information to know the field. They know what the the challenges and the problems and the desired um, things would be for that field. So this is very broad and it it really uh, is is a salesman type pitch and that's totally inappropriate on a on a proposal. Now C. Not bad, but it has one word in there that's overused and you should try to avoid, and that word is novel. Uh, novel is not a preferred uh, word because it really doesn't have all that much meeting. Uh, again, it gets a little bit towards the salesman sort of thing. On B, basically we're said, uh, the proposed research provides a new method for functionalization of heterocyclic compounds in a one pot synthesis using an iron catalyst. Uh, it's a little bit questionable that I even put new in there because if I'm giving this to people that are knowledgeable in the field, they would know that this hadn't been done before and it's desirable and so forth and so on for these reasons. So again, being uh, more factual, factual, less salesmanship because again, this is going to people that are knowledgeable in the field, that are aware of the field. Okay, Mike, next question. All right, and again, this question is appearing in the text. So this is, which of the following do you think is the best way to start the proposal section on experimental plan? Would it be A, in this project, we will study the functionalization of hydrocarbons and aromatic compounds and test their physical properties, bioactivity, and shelf stability by a variety of methods. B, in this project, we will study the functionalization of sp3 carbon atoms of aliphalic alkalines, cyclic alkanes, and alkenes. Or C, in this project, we will initially focus on the functionalization of sp3 carbon atoms in hexane molecules with an iron catalyst. And just not too many have voted now, so I'm going to leave this open for a little bit longer. And we'll close this poll in five. Four, three, two, one. All right, and on this, 42% uh, said A, which was the largest portion, 21% said B, and 36% said C. So Nancy, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, so this is my teaching moment. You gave me my teaching moment here. Uh, A is actually the least preferred 
for starting the experimental plan. Remember back on another slide, I said in your, your objectives, the experimental plan needed to flow uh, directly from that. This is a hand wave. You're gonna do a whole bunch of stuff. In other words, I, as a program officer, I read that as give me money and we'll go in the lab and find something to do. When you start that experimental plan and that those good management skills, you wanna show that you have something very specifically uh, you, you have a very specific game plan. In that respect, B is not too bad, but I prefer C in this one, and I don't know that you necessarily need to use the word initially in there, but the point is, when I read that, when I start the experimental procedure that, I know exactly what you're gonna do when you get that money and you walk into the lab with it, and what you're gonna do and that you have a good plan. This goes back to that comment on managerial skills. Uh, it, it flows back to that. Okay, exemplary hypothesis. There's nothing magical about a hypothesis. If you cannot reduce what you want to do or what you are, are trying to show to a simple sentence or two, then you probably need to think about that more carefully because uh, you, you don't have it you don't have it well enough organized in your mind. Now, granted, you're gonna say a lot more and there's gonna be a lot more detail to it, but you should be able to summarize what you're going to do and when your hypothesis or your, the problem in a sentence or two. And it doesn't, there's no magic word for it. I mean, this one, the proposed research will test the hypothesis that catalyst XYZ will oxidize compounds having AB functionality, or simply we hypothesize that. No, there's no magic formula, there's nothing magic, just a good solid sentence or two that clearly describes what you're, you're intending to do. Similarly, for the objectives, straightforward sentences. So the first objective of the research is to construct the new catalyst X, Y, Z for metals X, X and ligands Y and Z. And the second objective is to test that, that catalyst. Now, this is a sequential set of objectives. Uh, if I do this, I have to feel fairly confident that my first objective is is uh, fairly straightforward to do. Uh, and, and obviously I'm going to need to, to give some caveats here about the fact that I think that you know should go fairly straightforward, that the bigger test is gonna be whether it actually works. Um, the other thing that to point out, you can have objectives that are, are parallel objectives, so they don't, one does not depend on the other. And again, this is a point where uh, being very realistic about what the potential challenges are and how you tend to deal with them is quite important. Okay, in writing the proposal, I think there's three things that you definitely need to be very cognizant of. There's several things on this list. I cannot emphasize strongly enough that you need to write a topical outline. It does not have to be that English outline with A, Bs, and Cs on it, but you need to do a topical outline that you can, um, that, that uh, uh, you can follow. And similarly, draw, drafting your main graphics if you have, want to have uh, reaction schematics, if you want to have, um, if you want to have uh, uh, data charts and so forth. If you get those two things done, you have the bare bones of it, and this will keep it focused, and this will keep it organized. And then finally, most usually, you have to have uh, some sort of approval if you're doing this through an institution. Be sure that you understand what that system is, and that you have plenty of time to get the approval. Okay, some common pitfalls, follow the guidelines. Every agency is different, follow the guidelines very carefully. You can have your proposal returned to you without review if you don't follow these guidelines. And again, those are gonna be the agency's, agency's rules. Okay, and our next uh, question, Mike? All right, uh, this is the final question we're going to ask you all, and that is, Plagiarism only applies to literature articles authored by other researchers. Is this statement true or false? And you can go ahead and again, just answer your question by clicking on one of those radio buttons. And I am going to be closing this poll in five, four, three, two, one. And we had 14% uh, say true and 86% say false. So I'll turn it back over to you, Nancy. Okay, so most of you do have the correct answer. Plagiarism applies to any published article. If you are the author of an article and it is published, 
that those the copyright has been uh, given to the the publisher. That's one of the things you have to sign when the when the article is published in virtually every country. And so you do not you no longer own the rights to that. So you have to treat uh, your um, quoting from your papers uh, as any other as from any other source. Bulk cutting and cut, cut and paste copying from published work is not good. You need to abide by the guidelines of, of how to limit that. Uh, certainly, uh, extensive cut and paste is, is bad. And again, anything that's copied needs to be properly quoted and cited and so forth and so on. Uh, this is something that um, in, in the good old days was harder to find. Now there are just like there are in, in a pub, there is in publishing. There are many programs that can identify if this is cut and paste copy. So this is this is not you. you it's one thing you can get caught on very easily if you uh, don't abide by this rule. Okay, the reviewing the biography. Did you use the right bibliography? Did you use the right form? Again, each agency has its own form. Don't take the bibliography off of one and put it in the next one. Use the form you're supposed to use. Uh, I throw out this about age of references. Um, basically, if you have a lot of old references, you've got to question the fact of, did I use the right search terms? Is this some sort of research that people are still going to be interested in? Uh, that, that's something you need to think. There may be a good reason for, for, for going ahead with this project, but you need to ask yourself, because all the references are old, you've got to ask yourself a few questions. And then the number of different research groups cited. If you only cite one or two groups, you've got you know 40 references, but they're all from one or two groups. You may be doing Me Too science. Uh, and there's two problems in that, one of which is the level of originality, the other of which is if these groups have all of these papers, they may have tried what you're proposing and it didn't work, or they may have tried it and it did work, and the article about it is in press. Huge problem, typographical errors. 30 to 50% of our reviewers and decision makers are extremely sensitive to typographical errors. Uh, I am not a good proofer myself, and so uh, you may want to get uh, someone to help you. It is not necessarily that you need to get a scientist to help you. Sometimes uh, somebody who's not a scientist is, a scientist reading is, is wrapped up in the science. Somebody that's not a scientist may be more sensitive, but huge problem. Okay, these are some uh, quotes about uh, reviews of uncompetitive proposals. Each of these is an exact quote from a reviewer, but each one represents a concept that has been repeated many times. The PI has failed to refer to important studies in the past two or three years. This often happens when somebody resubmits a proposal and does not update their literature search. If you resubmit a proposal, update that literature search. Uh, you don't want to get caught on that one. Much important experimental information, equipment information was submitted. I cannot tell what's going to be done and how. I covered that earlier. This proposal is a simple extension of the PI's PhD thesis. When you're, if you're doing for a research grant as a professor, you're going to want to show that you, you're, you're creative on your own. There also may be some legal implications of your, your, your professor may have some intellectual property rights. That's a whole other issue. Uh, okay, this proposal seems to feel only one outcome is possible and fails to consider as other, others. If what we, if if what if that were true, was uh, the studies would be unnecessary. You don't want to see that. Okay, and I don't know that I read that correctly because I have a panel covering that. Okay, and then finally, this work can certainly be carried out, but it does not address any topic of of broad current interest. I would probably not read the paper read, paper describing the results. Okay, and then we're going to do a couple minutes here on facing rejection. Okay, you're going to get rejected on proposals. If you write proposals at all, that's an inevitable thing. The number of applications is much, much greater than the available funding. And so rejection is a part of life. And it's not pretty, it's not happy. And it happens to everybody. In my history with PRF, I know of several examples when the people who have no won Nobel Prizes apply and have not received grants um, for various different reasons, some of which is you know, novelty or, uh, or we, we do seed money grants, so it needs to be significantly different from their previous work. So it happens to everybody from the beginner to a Nobel laureate, and you just have to be prepared for that. So. Let's talk about facing rejection. There was a nice article written uh, in February 2020. It came out February 
right, 2020 in nature. And it says responding to rejection as a learning experience. And you definitely, yes, it hurts and you have to kind of, you know, you're going to be emotional, but don't let the emotions get the better of you. Uh, you, you need to get to the bottom of why this was not successful. What can you do to, uh, is it something worth pursuing further? Are there things that can be addressed? Or is it something that probably is not something that's going to be appealing to, to an agency to fund? So don't be overcome by the emotions, get feedback. Typically, most agencies will send you excerpts of reviewer comments, so you can get that. Uh, or reviewer comments, you don't get the reviewer's name, but you get the reviewer comments uh, in, in some form or another. And also, this is a good time to talk to your program officer. They can give you some insight on, is this a viable topic for this agency? And, uh, you know, advice on whether it's it's worth pursuing further. And then with the topic, typographical error things, if you're seeing comments about, um, things like typographical errors or errors in labeling figures and so forth. This is this can be, when it's a tight competitive situation, this is something that can ruin your chances very, very quickly, even though the idea behind it is very good. So uh, again, the, the attention to detail, the getting feedback and using this as a time to grow is important. Again, not a happy time. Now, another thing, so you get rejected from my agency, and then I send you, the, and a few months later, I send you a request for a review. And maybe the gut feeling is yell and scream, and why would I review for that agency? Wrong approach. One way you learn about writing grants and, and how the process works is by doing reviews. If Particularly if you're starting out, if you're asked to do reviews, consider this a very uh, important learning experience. Now, we have help for you on that. You'll notice there, there is a web-based free training with uh, on, on how to do reviews. Now, this was done by ACS Publications, so it does have, uh, there is one section of it that's more about evaluating, you know, after the fact, the, the, the end results. But uh, it's not easy. It took me a couple of mornings to do. It has about six, I don't know, six or so modules in it, but it has things like the ethics, how to go about an analyzing uh, the document, uh, writing up your results, uh, things that you should consider. So it's a very useful, whether you're doing um, for uh, publications or for a, a grant writing. But again, taking the, taking the tack that, uh, you know, I don't want to review because they didn't fund me, is probably the exact opposite of what you should be doing. Now, let's end it on a happy note before the questions. And the happy note is, so you get your grant. And I had this question asked last week when I was uh, giving the talk, uh, the talk uh, for ACS India, and I had not included this uh, previously uh, in, in my discussions. And I thought, you know, this is a great, great way to end this because we've given you the downside. Now we'll give you the upside. What does the agency expect when they give you money? It's not give you money and you're out the door and do whatever you want. First of all, the agency expects you to follow the experimental plan and budget set out in your application. So you are expected to follow, do what you said you were gonna do. Now, we know things happen. The postdoc leaves. Uh, the first experiments don't work out like you think. You have the lab shut down because of COVID. All these sorts of things, okay. We know that happens, so how do you handle it? If changes are needed, your program officer is your resource. We work with you to try to work through this. We give extensions. We we help, uh, you know, we may approve transfer of, of spending funds in a different way. But ask before you do it. Don't jump in and do this, and then, and then, then we find out about it later. Work with your program officer to do that. Now, the third one is extremely important, not to you, but to your institution make all required reports in a timely fashion. You will have, depending on the agency, various reports to make. You may have a narrative explaining your research. You may have reports with regard to personnel and funding and all of the, the spending of the money and so forth. Now, I say it's important to you and your reputation and getting further grant, but if you are negligent in turning in your reports, it may impact your entire institution's ability to get grants. So this is extremely important to be be punctual about this, to, to, to take this very seriously and do as fun. And finally, uh, we hope you have publishable results and we'd like to see those published. And on that, I will turn it back to you, York, for questions. 
Thank you so much for a wonderful talk, Nancy. Uh, the audience really learned a lot, and actually, I learned something as well. So that is really wonderful. Before we get to the questions, though, a brief comment about the ACS career planning tool for chemical scientists called ChemIDP. This is a free online tool which is accessible um, everywhere in the world, and it focuses on self-assessment, goal-setting, skill-strengthening, and career exploration. So any graduate student, undergraduate student, and postdoctoral researcher should consider using that tool to map out your career. But now I think we should get involved with the audience and we got a lot of wonderful questions. And let me um, navigate to the first one. Um, Nancy, early on in your presentation, you pointed out that it would be very important to describe or to, to highlight that you will be able to manage your grant, right? Manage the budget, etc. How do you actually demonstrate in a proposal that you have very good management skills? Well, first of all, it's going to be the proposal is going to be well written and laid out so that one can understand, reading it can understand that you have a plan. The plan is plausible. It's believable that you will get the results with with what you're planning to do. In doing that, and depending on the agency and how you mentioned, you're going to talk about what you have for resources um, and how you're going to use them. For example, maybe if you're in a doctoral institution, you're not going to have to talk that much about resources. But let's say you're in an institution that's primarily undergraduate, uh, you may need some kinds of equipment that are, are not there in your institution or not typically there in your institution but might happen to be in yours and so you're going to want to mention you know that you have this or you have an arrangement where you can uh, you can get the necessary equipment that you do for example that's just one example of it thank you nancy we have another question which basically asks i don't have research results published in a certain area but i would like to apply for funding exactly in that area is that a problem and how could i convince the reviewers to fund this type of research if i don't have necessarily published in that field yet okay so that that goes back to the agency issue and admittedly lots of agencies do require preliminary results in even the fact of publications in some cases. Now, that said, do some agency hunting and some funding source hunting. For example, PRF, uh, my agency, we give what we call seed money grants and preliminary results, not only not, we don't need publications. In fact, uh, you probably wouldn't get a grant if you had publications in the field, okay? Uh, we're looking for people that are have an idea, they have a plan formed, and they need the so-called seed money to start that initial research. And again, that's how our agency does it. So look at your what the agency requirements are. They vary from uh, in various different ways. Uh, sometimes and uh, a possibility is um, maybe uh, what you're looking at is some internal funding or some small funding, like maybe the the Lions Club or the Rotary Club of, of has a small grant that can give you some funding. Uh, this is particularly if you're in a small school, can give you some funding that will get you started. So uh, search for search for money. It may not, uh, yes, apply to NSF, you're probably going to need all of this. But there are other agencies with different missions and, and uh, again, find your agency. That is wonderful advice. Thank you, Nancy. Since you mentioned PRF, uh, there's one question specifically for PRF. Can an assistant professor apply for the ACS PRF funds and what is their success rate currently? Okay, so if they are tenure track, no problem. If they are in an institution which does not have a tenure system, then we do have uh, some alternate options there, but but they'll need to contact me to uh, contact us to to get that information. Okay, so but if you're tenure track and you're an assistant professor, uh, uh, then then uh, you should be eligible for PRF funding. Um, and the second part of that question, York, success rate. Success rate. Okay, so we run at about. 20% actually in our most recent meeting, which was last week, uh, we're up a little over 20% uh, in, in funding. And this is a very good uh, success rate actually in comparison to other funding agencies. So um, keep PRF in mind as you plot your path forward. Thank um, you for advertising, so, 
<laughs> we got actually a couple of questions from individuals that are concerned about bias in the review process. Could you talk about how program officers try to avoid bias among reviewers when they review proposals from individuals that come originally from, for example, developing countries or far away from the country where they are doing right now research? Okay, first of all, um, in our, if you if you look at the list of people in the last two or three years that have gotten grants from PRF, if you look at just simply looking at the list of names, you can see a tremendous diversity. Okay, tremendous diversity. Um, and and we we point that you can see that by you know looking at the annual report. So we have a considerable diversity to begin with. Now. Where are we going to go to get reviewers? We ask people to suggest reviewers, so that's one source. Uh, we try to, ideally, we we ask both reviewers that the PI suggests for our agency. The reviewer can suggest some. We will we will pick uh, some from what the reviewer the PI suggests. We will pick some that what we suggest, and we use a variety of people. Uh, we use people from again um, people who have applied before people who have been given in and names by uh, into our database maybe from previous uh, submissions um, we also use I use a wide variety of expertise in terms of development in the career I think it's I think it's very important um, for uh, people that are beginning to have that experience and so I use a lot of reviewers that are maybe it'll be their first review or they're very new to doing this and I use other reviewers that are, you know, very established people. And I think you'll find that in the uh, younger set that probably it's uh, are a little more open to the concepts of diversity than some of the old graybeards. So that's one thing we're, we're doing there. The other thing about it is I think it's you say, well, you know, you're trying people out on this. How does that how does that give me good reviews? I think it gives you better reviews because the person that's well established in the field has been there a long time. They certainly have a wealth of knowledge and experience and all of that. But the person who is new to the field has a is probably been closer to the bench, so they have a little better understanding of the practicality of it, and they understand uh, a little more about some of the challenges. So I think you it both both ends benefit by making a a diverse uh, thing. If we do have, and I will say it in terms of diversity, uh, we say we give back the excerpts. We do screen the review comments for um, for things that are inappropriate um, that that are said. And that happens very, very rarely that we find something. We certainly that would not go back to the individual. And if it's something that um, again is is uh, very obvious at all we'll make a note in our database and that person will not be invited to be a reviewer again thank you the next question goes actually targets the heart of the grant proposal the idea right so how does someone know that the scientific idea is novel enough and has the potential to get funded do you have any suggestions any ideas how to be sure that your idea is resonating with reviewers or uh, with the agency? Okay, I think there are several steps. One of which is this is a good question to raise with your program officer. Uh, is this something that the, you know, we, we're seeing an interest in, in the agency? Or is it something that has been talked about so many times that we're seeing some kind of fatigue on this, if you will? Um, we, we sometimes have um, as we've seen a zillion CH functionalization uh, proposals. And yes, some of them get funded, but it has to be something that stands out fairly significantly to be funded because we see a lot of CH functionalization um, uh, proposals coming up. So, so that's, that's one thing that you're, you're looking at. Um, you're obviously, you know, being knowledgeable in the field uh, is important. Uh, if you've if you've done your homework and done a good literature search, then you should have a sense of what the big questions are, what the good problems to solve, what needs to be done. So I think literature, uh, talking with your program officer, good literature search. I think those are key uh, things. Attending meetings and hearing talks and that sort of thing is a way to to get a, a feeling for um, the level of the state of the art, if you will. And if I just may add, you pointed that earlier, 
every funding agency or many funding agencies have a database of recently awarded grants with abstracts. So to get a flavor of what others have submitted and which caliber of research they proposed, I would really recommend to go to those abstracts to get a flavor of what was funded recently and compare the quality of uh, that uh, proposed research idea to the quality uh, of the research idea that you have uh, developed. Yes, that's um, a good point. Good point, York. Then, thank you. <laughs> Let me ask you about plagiarism. Hmm. So, what are the plagiarism risks of disclosing your idea and methods in a proposal or an application? Well, I don't know that it's really plagiarism so much as it is outright scientific ethics violation. Uh, typically, when a reviewer is asked to do a review, uh, they are um, they are given when they're given the, the information, it's made clear to them that it is proprietary information that they are not to share it, they are not to keep a copy, etc., etc., etc. Now, is everybody in the world honest and perfect and decent? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Uh, if that seems to happen, which occasionally it does, then uh, we uh, we go back and uh, you know there's investigation, and this may bar the person, and then, then, then it's an ethics consideration. It may bar that person that has done this from uh, being able to submit to that agency again. Uh, it's it can be very very serious if this happens. Uh, it's not. Um, it's not something again. It's it, we we've not seen very much of that at, at all. That's that's not been a pro, been a problem that we have have had any real instance with a couple of instances of that, but but nothing uh, really significant. Most people are, are pretty pretty honest about it, uh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, let me just add. Um... The National Science Foundation has an extra office uh, that really follows those kind of crime cases. Uh, and it's the Office of Investigations, and they publish every year an annual report. And if you have some minutes left, I would recommend to read some of those reports to see what's actually going on out there. However, that said, uh, it's a small, small fraction, or a very small number of cases actually occur. So I wouldn't really be worried about that. I would share your research idea as you planned it with the reviewers, with the funding agency. And the funding agency makes, makes it very, very clear that this informa information is confidential and cannot use for any other purpose than reviewing and giving the funding agency a recommendation. Jorg, before we uh, move on, let's look at this from the other side too. If you're asked to review a proposal and it is similar to your research, the appropriate thing to do is to say, you know, I, I don't, I'm not comfortable doing it. It's too close to what I do. So you would turn it, turn it back in. And we do have this happen uh, fairly frequency, frequently. And if you take that course that we talked about, it talks about that in the ethics, uh, it, that it's there. But the, the ethical thing to do, if you are asked to review something and you feel like it's too close to your own work, or it might be misinterpreted that you have, uh, you know, taken something from it, turn it back in and say, send a note to the program officer and say. Thank you very much for asking me, but this is too close to what I do. I have to decline. Excellent. Thank you, Nancy. So here's a question from someone who lives abroad and considers applying for funding here in the United States. I could imagine that there are two scenarios. So uh, moving to the United States and doing research in the United States with a grant from, from a federal or US-based organization or applying and doing the research abroad. Can you talk about uh, if that's possible in general, maybe through PRF or other funding well, agencies? Yeah, we're gonna, the, the, first, the first thing is that, uh, you know, we do fund some research at the doctoral level abroad, okay, uh, in, in countries that meet the, the criteria of transparency index criteria. Uh, we have to be careful because we have to meet certain standards because we're entrusted with money by a court to do this. And so uh, we have to meet certain ethic, uh, certain standards with regard to that. So, so yes, there, there's funding that's available that in the, from the U.S. that might go abroad. That's, that's a possibility. Uh, the other thing that might be uh, appropriate too to say is that, for example, with PRF, and I think it's probably true for NSF and so forth, 
you may be able to work in the U.S. on a grant um, that is, is a U.S. funded grant. If you're in a lab in the U.S., there's no requirement that we have that you have to have citizenship or status if anybody in the lab can be, any, any student in the lab can be paid. So uh, it kind of depends on the kind of grant you have uh, and what you're asking for. Other things like some of these travel grants and those kinds of things, then again, what, what's the criteria of the grant? No, thank you. Wonderful answer. Um, we have many more questions, but I also want to be mindful of the time. So let me ask you one about the bibliography. So you, you mentioned it's important to have uh, really current references or you know, current bibliography, bibliography, sorry for that. Uh, so how old is old and citing in a bibliography? Okay, I've seen things clear back to, uh, oh my gosh, I've seen I, I've seen things go back to the 1800s in the bibliography, and that may not be bad, but if all your references are from 1800, this is a problem. So uh, it, it, consider the context of it. What I what I'm concerned about is if virtually all your references are old. Uh, having a few old references is is not bad. It's it's what's relevant to the topic, and one reason. Uh, why you might want an old reference, and I give this example sometimes in my talks, um, is that sometimes there's a pro there's been research in the past, but it's kind of come to a standstill because you don't there, there's something that's that seems to be insurmountable, and now you have a technique so that you can overcome that difficulty, and and so that's very important that you cite that old research and and what happened and and why you can overcome it. The example I give for that is is the time of flight mass spectrometer. It was the first mass spectrometer discovered in about 1900. And it was nothing more than really a toy of physical chemists until about 1990. And the reason for that is everybody knew how it worked. It was quite simple, but you had so many ions coming down that test tube, or that flight tube, test tube, flight tube. You had so many ions coming down that flight tube having a detector that could pick them up and a data system that could collect them, uh, other than if you were doing something, uh, you know, a gas phase, very simplistic thing, uh, that it was not useful at all. And so in about late 80s, early 90s, well, we had a couple things happen. We had the, um, the moldy desorption technique and Lo and behold, about this same time, we had mass, I actually worked in my postdoc on the pre, pre, uh, predecessor of the Maldi instrument, okay? Um, and it was called the llama, and it was about as stubborn as the animal, I will tell you that. But the problems were, what happened was we got better detectors and we got high-speed computer systems. And so now this is a workhorse in the system because it, we now had, we overcame the problem. So if it's old literature and and it's something that's you know a problem that's now overcome this is this is great so it doesn't necessarily mean old's bad and also it doesn't mean that you cite everything from a to z cite what's relevant it may be some or two or three pieces of literature that are quite old that are relevant to what you're doing but bring that up to date don't 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 dwell in the past unless you have something that's going to revolutionize uh, where you were Excellent. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, thank you for answering all those questions. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. And uh, before we close our session, actually, I'm wondering if there's one important lesson that our listeners should learn from your presentation today. What would that lesson be, Nancy? Well, I think the really important thing is that, first of all, how you write up your proposal is just as important as your idea. That's that's absolutely central to this uh, is the fact the importance of that and then and of course I can't leave with just saying one thing the the program officer is a resource for you and you'll see here the slide coming up about my my staff uh, and I and our contact information we are a resource for you and it doesn't matter if it's PRF or NSF or whatever the agency is use that resource because that resource can be very helpful to you in getting an effective report, making sure you stay, you follow all the rules, etc. And thank you all for your attendance and York for your wonderful help. Well, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and also invite you to join us, uh, join us for our free upcoming broadcasts. 
Uh, tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, we will begin a series highlighting the frontiers of chemistry research that is being co-produced with the ACS Committee on Science and ACS President H.N. Chang. Our first broadcast will feature Prof Professor Jianen Bao of Stanford University and her work on the skin-inspired organic sensors, which may change the way that humans interact with electronics in the near future. On Wednesday, June 2nd, we will be joined by a leading panel of experts in artificial intelligence who are going to provide a unique bird's eye view of our AI in chemistry and a panel discussion on emerging trends across industries that can drive better outcomes for your teams. And finally, on June 3rd, we will be returning with our biannual discourse with Paul Hodges of the New Normal Consulting and Bill Carroll of Carroll Applied Science. They are going to feature how shifts in production, demand patterns, and geopolitics are reshaping the chemical industry. We would love to hear what you think about our program. You can reach out to us through the ACS social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or by email at acswebinars at acs.org. We are also curious to hear what you thought of today's broadcast, and a short survey will pop up directly after the webinar that will just take a minute to complete. Also remember that the invitation email to view the recording from today's presentation will be sent to all registrants, and it will be open for a 24-hour period, after which it will be removed, edited, and become an ACS member benefit. And that wraps up our program for today. On behalf of all of us here at ACS, thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you again tomorrow.